and uh, what your fields of expertise are. Okay. Well, the first thing I should say is that I'm not a journalist, uh, and I don't play one in real life either. Uh, but I am the publisher for Mother Jones. Uh, this is Mother Jones. And uh, I've been publisher for the last two years. I co-manage uh, the organization with my CEO, Madeline Buckingham. Uh, I actually come out of a, a American uh, social change and nonprofit uh, background rather than from journalism. And um, I'm not sure if such a thing exists uh, in Italy or in Europe uh, to the extent that it does here, but uh, Mother Jones is this odd hybrid um, operation and that it is both a publishing organization, we put out a magazine and have a very active uh, digital publishing operation and at the same time we're a not-for-profit organization that has a mission uh, actually to change the world for the better. So we're trying to manage both uh, social change agenda uh, and a top-notch uh, journalism agenda at the same time. Perfect. So what are actually the uh, fields of the nonprofit organization? Well, uh, we try to fulfill our mission by doing uh, high-quality investigative reporting uh, that we publish both uh, in print and also online at motherjones.com. And uh, uh, we've been doing that since 1975. How has your activity as a publisher changed with uh, social media and new technologies? Um, well, I, I, me personally or uh, yes. for the organization as well? Me personally, uh, I can tell you that my reading habits have changed completely in the last couple of years. Uh, uh, I grew up in New York. Uh, I was raised in a family that had a, a daily newspaper delivered to its house. Uh, when I was growing up, there were six daily newspapers in New York City. Um, and so I read the New York Times every day. When I moved out to California, uh, I continued to subscribe to the Times until one day, about uh, two and a half years ago, I, I realized that uh, I was reading the New York Times twice, uh, once in print and once online, and that the stuff I was getting online was more up to date than what I was finding in the print version. And uh, although I loved reading it, I uh, finally decided on New Year's Day 2007 that I would step away from the print version of the Times and subscribe online, which I did. And so now most of my reading uh, news gathering happens online, whether it's uh, Twitter is my kind of main source of information and my Facebook feed and the Times and, of course, Mother Jones and then lots and lots of other folks who... Uh, uh, who are online only. So personally, uh, it's a very different way of living um, than than uh, what I grew up with. Um, organizationally, uh, just as big a change in the last few years. And uh, it's been really interesting for us to go through a transition from what was originally a print-driven organization with a website on the side to what it is now, which is really a multi-platform publishing organization. The magazine is still very strong. We've had a steady paid circulation for the last five or six years of about 200,000 people who subscribe to the magazine or buy it on the newsstand, which in the American context um, is reasonably good for a niche product like ours. Um, but the real growth in our audience has happened uh, in the last two years, uh, and it's almost entirely been online. And the other interesting thing about that online audience for us is that it is not the traditional consumer of Mother Jones reporting. It's a younger audience. Uh, it's a much more tech-savvy audience, uh, uh, and it's an engaged audience. And so uh, we've seen uh, really kind of stunning uh, actions happen uh, uh, as a result of the reporting that we've done when people read our stuff and decide that they need to do something about it. So um, I, I think it's fair to say that we, our heart is always uh, in the print uh, side of things. We believe there's a real important reason why uh, a print operation should continue. Uh, and at the same time, um, we go where our audience is going uh, and do a different kind of reporting online um, that really serves the people there. What do you think the difference, if you think there should be one, should be between what gets 
published online and what gets published on the paper version of a newspaper or a magazine. So for Mother Jones, everything that we publish in the print magazine is also published online. And what's been fascinating for us uh, to see is that a, a very important part of our community, our audience, uh, has no problem reading long-form journalism on the web. And in fact, there's been this resurgence of uh, interest in, t in reading long-form content and deep-dive investigative reporting on a digital platform. And there's no question that as the uh, tablets become more sophisticated and, you know, iPad 3 just came out with a much uh, better display and so on and so forth, that um, this will continue. So uh, it's actually less of an issue than one would have thought a while back. Um, that said, so that's all really important. Uh, that said, um, there, the huge advantage that we've seen from uh, moving to a digital platform for us is that it's actually for the reporter, uh, not so much the demand from the audience, but it's what kind of reporting uh, a journalist can do when two things are happening. One is that the story is not finished when the uh, first piece is published. It, it continues. Uh, we call it iterative reporting. You just keep adding, number one. And number two is that, um, uh, you know, as, as Dan Gilmore, uh, uh, who's an uh, ex-San Jose Mercury reporter and one of the American theorists of uh, the new media uh, ecosystem, uh, put it a bunch of years ago, is that the audience is smarter than you are. And if you start from that point of humility and use your, you know, develop a relationship with the community of readers um, that engage with you online, uh, you, it's amazing what will happen. And we've seen that in a number of stories that we've done uh, where our readership became our sources as well. A uh, very powerful uh, a mutual relationship between professional working journalists and, uh, and the community of support. So what do you think will be actually the role of uh, social media and social network integration for the future of journalism? Um, the future. Uh, yeah, I looked at that question and I thought to myself, I really don't know what the future looks like. I can talk a little bit about what the present looks like, which is it's essential. <laughs> uh, you know, again, for us, um, uh, five of the top ten traffic sources for our website come from social media now, right? Whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Reddit or StumbleUpon or whatever. So the audience is there and their interest, they want to know what's going on. And our job is to adapt uh, our presentation of content in a way uh, that is uh, approachable by people who are living inside Facebook or who are scanning Twitter for, you know, interesting tidbits and links to follow up on. So I think in that sense, the future has already be, uh, seriously arrived in terms of social media. It is the present tense of journalism right now, as far as we can tell. I guess there, there's, one, there's one other thing I would say on that uh, Maria, yes. um, and that has to do with the the role of, of organizations like ours, which is not only to report the news, but to do it in a way that it contributes to positive social change um, without leaving the independent position of a working journalist. I mean, that, that, just to clarify, it's very important to us that the journalists retain their independence of uh, uh, perspective and ability to source their content properly. Um, uh, but, but once that's done and once they publish the story, the question becomes, well, what happens to it? And um, uh, our job in part is to make sure that something happens with the stuff that we think is important. And uh, what we've seen, again, in the past two to three years, is that traditional methods of moving a story out into either an activist community or to other journalists or people in the media uh, no longer work. And uh, increasingly, uh, social media is the pathway by which change-oriented uh, work actually happens. One of the biggest, if not the biggest, issue um Italian publishers, at least at least the ones I've known so far, the biggest problem they have with this is that basically um, there's this idea that the news should be for free. So uh. they are 
with uh, you know they have the problem of deciding whether to keep it free or uh, to uh, get users to pay for it but in, in that case right. users actually become very fewer than if it were for free you know so that's right. the main question how do you um, right. actually integrate that aspect the uh, right. getting uh, you know getting the economical means to sustain your uh, activity right, right. So, can I give you two answers to that? Two yes. different pieces. There's two different pieces of it, at least in the American context. You know, really beginning in the 1980s here in the United States, uh, the news business uh, began to experience a very intense process of consolidation. Uh, and, and that really took off in the 1990s when there were changes in national rules governing how many outlets uh, a single company could own. And so on the one hand, the result is that nowadays there are six, uh, six corporations in the United States that own the vast majority of cable TV, tele network television, radio, uh, and print uh, and online uh, properties. And uh, so there's been this intense consolidation of ownership. Now, the means by which that happened was that the, this consolidation process was paid for by other people's money and highly leveraged debt uh, uh, came into play. The, the result and, and the reason they thought uh, that they could do this is because historically uh, metropolitan newspapers uh, that served big cities had very high profit margins because they were the only player in town in terms of advertising revenue and and so they could charge a premium for that and of course that worked to the advantage of the newsroom as well because there was this cross subsidy from uh, uh, advertising friendly sections of a newspaper like fashion and sports and gossip over to the news hall which was the harder stuff to sell advertising against well as a result of the change in technology, that expectation of double-digit return rates on their investments started to fade away. And with that, the whole financial basis for this highly leveraged, highly indebted uh, consolidation strategy began to fall apart. And what we're seeing, I, I, I say all this because um, that's often forgotten in the discussions about the changes in, in, uh, in where people get their news from and what has happened here in the United States at least with, uh, with the media is that it is a consequence of an investment strategy and a consolidation strategy at least in good measure uh, that has caused this problem and so now we're faced with a problem really here in the states which is in general uh, I think it's fair to say that the American people are very poorly served by their news industry, uh, the quality of the information that they're getting has declined. The the number of reporters has gone down tremendously, and and the news business. I just read this article uh, recently that the newspaper industry in the United States is the fastest declining industry of all here in in the USA. Wow. So that's all by way of, of context, because then it comes to organizations like like us. So we had a different model right from the beginning, which was uh, to use the U.S. Uh, system of nonprofit organization uh, and nonprofit status, charitable status, to organize a, a mission-driven investigative reporting organization back in the 70s, which was very unusual, although there are some large magazine titles like National Geographic uh, and so on that have also been uh, uh, not-for-profit. Uh, anyway. The point is that what that did uh, was, first of all, it required us as a not-for-profit to develop a relationship with our community of readers because our readers help support what we do. They make contributions to Mother Jones to help pay for the reporting. And we take that, those donations in addition to the advertising that we sell and the subscriptions that people pay to purchase the magazine and put that together to support the kind of investigative reporting uh, and journalism that we do. As the commercial industry in the United States, the commercial news business in the United States has really uh, fallen away as, a, as a, a workable business model, there's been more and more attention put to this nonprofit 
alternative. And so you have uh, uh, quite a bit of discussion going on here in the States about whether this is a workable uh, alternative. Uh, there's a lot of money going into it, and there's a lot of hope that this will be the, the solution. I, I honestly am not sure that it is because I don't think it can get to the scale that um, would really fill the gap that the commercial business, news business, used to have. But it plays a very important part, especially for expensive investigative journalism. So that gets to the, the paywall issue. That right. gets to the paywall issue because um, what we have actually are beginning to see with the first experiments in a, in a paywall approach is that if you set up a hard wall, it's not going to work. People will walk away. You won't be able to generate enough audience uh, uh, money from your audience to make it work. But if you, and this is what the New York Times is really seeing, is if you develop a relationship with that group of people who really care about you, which is what the New York Times in our context, in our uh, context, is really going after. They're going after the heavy-duty users of their content and asking them. To, to subscribe, to get through this, not a wall, but it's more like a fence. Right. You know, there are ways to get around it. So they're not looking at the casual user. They're looking at the hardcore users and saying, look, you guys really believe in what we do. We are asking you to support that by subscribing to the digital edition of the New York Times and make it happen. Well, that sounds very, very much like the nonprofit or public television, public media version of the donation ask. It, it's, it's a matter of linguistics and not of practice that makes it different. So that would be the, that would be the takeaway. I would, it's a long-winded way of saying that the, really the key thing here and the problem that most newspapers have, frankly, is that you have to have a relationship, an honest relationship, with your community of readers. If you do not, if you treat them arrogantly, if you think you know more than they do, if you think they're just there to suck money from, it won't work. It won't work. So that's that's my that's my theory of the paywall. You know, the Times had a paywall some years ago. The New York Times had a paywall up some years ago. Uh that didn't work. Yeah. Uh and so they took it down and then they took two to three years to rethink how they were going to do this. They looked at what the Wall Street Journal was doing. They looked at what the Financial Times was doing and thought, you know, the time, the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal are highly specialized uh, newspapers uh, that um, they could probably get away with this very strict paywall arrangement, subscription arrangement. And the Times realized that as a general purpose newspaper, they couldn't do it. And so, again, using the metaphor of the fence rather than, than the wall, there are ways in which you can consume Times content uh, and hack around the wall, no problem. It's kind of a pain, but you can do it. But they didn't care about that. It's like if you're going to do that, if you're going to read you know, 10 articles a month or if you're actually going to take the extra effort to um, hack our uh, JavaScript, that's okay, go ahead and do it. Because what they really wanted to do was to find the small percentage of uh, frequent readers of the New York Times who clearly are invested in, a, in this paper and begin a relationship with them. And I think, you know, they could have gone farther in terms of that relationship building strategy, uh, frankly, but, um, but I think they have the opportunity to do it. It's, a, it's an open question in the United States context whether regional papers have any clue about doing this. There, are been, there have been some very interesting experiments among um, a smaller chain of papers, but uh, the big chains, uh, I, don't, I don't see a whole lot of creative thinking there yet. I mean, our, again, in our situation, um, uh, so we give away everything for free, right? There's no fence. There's no fence. Uh, and, um, and like well, just about everybody else, we sell advertising against the traffic, number one, of course, but we also raise uh, donations online from our online readership. And so we have to have this dialogue going on. It's not perfect. Uh, uh, we um, would like to improve it even more and have more engagement uh, with them. But it's, cl it's clearly the way to go for, for us. We have a, you know, as a mission-driven journalism organization, 
uh, uh, people search us out as well as we go to find them and because they're looking for a different take on the news of the day. So um, we try to work with that then to build that connection with people over time and some percentage of them um, end up actually uh, financially supporting Mother Jones and that's, that's what we're really looking for. Um, in view of the panel which you will participate in, yeah. I would like to ask um, what you think the integration between um, the online very fast uh, yeah. updates, you know, like Twitter-like uh, updates, yeah. um, will actually work with uh, more specific and in-depth analysis of facts that are going on. You know, I, I just looked at the program um, today actually I didn't realize it had been posted and and saw that the title of my panel is something like what happened to the weekly yes indeed. which of course we've never been <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like uh, well we used to be a monthly you know now we're a bi-monthly but I hope that still fits so <laughs> that's that's sort of an aside but um, uh, I mean, again, I, I you know you have to use different repertorial and presentation tools depending on what the story is and and uh, what you're trying to do. But uh, what we've seen is that adding Twitter, uh, adding tools like Storify, uh, integrating um, video clips uh, and audio, um, using social media as a part of the story development process as well as the storytelling process. Uh, if you do it intelligently and, and 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 think about it beforehand and kind of test and you know fix as you go along, it's actually really cool. It's great because it gives you all these other tools to tell the story um, that we didn't have before. And and again, like I said before, the the great thing about uh, the digital uh, and one of the great things about the digital environment is that the story never ends. You right. can always go back to it and, and enrich it. And so you begin to develop this history of, uh, uh, of what happened that becomes a resource in itself. It becomes a kind of metadata that can be used uh, later on. My last question would be, what is uh, currently your media diet? My media diet? Yes. Uh, well, I'm not going to tell you about the trashy television that I watch. <laughs> so, I'm not going to go there. Uh, although I can't wait to see him. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been in Italy. It's not since the 80s, actually. So, I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of crazy American television you've got on there in, in translation or, or whatever. So. so, my media diet is uh, uh, in the morning. Uh, I'll, I, uh, there are three sources of information I check on the Times, New York Times, uh, Twitter, and my email. And that gets me oriented for the morning. Uh, and then during the day, because of the work that I do, I'm checking uh, American political blogs. Uh, uh, Talking, Point, Talking Points Memo is a very important, uh, really great uh, blog uh, based out of New York that does uh, political coverage. Uh, that's a it's a steady a part of my diet, uh, and then there's just tons of other uh, political blogs that I I uh, track, uh, although not every day. Uh, and then I'm also looking at uh, the main U.S. newspapers uh, online, the Washington Post, uh, usually the L.A. Times, uh, from time to time. Um, the U.K. Guardian is an important source for us as well. Um, and then because of the work that we do uh, as a general purpose magazine, we have uh, uh, reporters assigned to cover food and agriculture, uh, climate and the environment, uh, reproductive rights and human rights, the American political system, uh, and then some international affairs and national defense issues. So I'm trying to like at least stay relatively literate on each of these, uh, each of these topics. Um, that's my diet. So that's it's more like, yeah, it's more like ice cream and a lot of candy and not much of a diet. So it's mostly, basically, uh, it's online, right? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I have, uh, I read quite a bit of stuff uh, on my tablet. The, uh, I think I get two magazines in print. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. The bloggers and uh, people like Chris and Ariane are doing a great job mm -hmm. in trying to uh, literate, you know, uh, journalists in, in this field. But it just seems that the big, big, huge newspapers are still, you know, just trying to get there. Yeah, I think they really missed some opportunities uh, in uh, in the last decade or so to to really take the lead on on innovation. And now there, uh, several of them, at least in the U.S. context, are are trying to catch up to what others uh, have already begun to really experiment with. And a, a bunch of the people that are speaking at the conference really yeah. have tremendous uh, innovations uh, going on. Of course, living here. In, in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's just it's part of the air you breathe of, of technology innovation and so on. Um, the uh, uh, yeah, I was uh, I have a 22 year old son, um, so I was talking to him yesterday, uh, and I said, you know, where do you? I'm doing this conference in Italy and stuff, and what do you? Where do you get your news from? Uh, he used to read the Huffington Post all the time. I said, right. do you still read HuffPo? He says, no, I don't like it anymore because it's too, like, all that stuff on the right side of the column. I don't like it that much. I said, okay, well, where do you where do you get your news from? He says, well, and he's not a particularly, um, you know, news hound kind of guy. He just wants to know what's going on. And he's very busy and doesn't have a lot of time. He says, well, the two places I go is they're both on my phone. Right. I downloaded the app from the Associated Press. Mm -hmm. And I read the headlines from the Associated Press. And then to see what else is going on in the world, I have uh, Reddit. Oh. I check Reddit. Yeah, right. So, oh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to tell you this. I mean, I, yeah. I just took, you know, the newspaper because we had it there in, in the uh, yeah. meetings room. And um, I was like, how much would this piece of advertising cost, you know, if someone wants to, uh, you know, publish it? And it was a half page on the left. I, I just discovered that stuff on the left is cheaper than stuff on the right. So yeah. um, he was like, well, this would be, if, if he's a regular, regular client, it would be like 30 to 40,000. If not, if just occasional, it would be 50,000 euro. Well, that's, and that, that kind of gets back to what I was saying before. I mean, the thing, the, the, what that guy remembers and what happened here is that the newspaper lived in a world of scarcity. Yeah. There were only so many pages that you could put advertising in. And so they basically had a monopoly on what could be advertised. And so they could charge monopoly prices and right. they got used to it. It was great. Right. And it paid for news. It paid. That's how we paid for news. Well, one thing is true in an internet uh, environment. And that is, it's not about scarcity. There's a abundance of opportunity right. to advertise. So it's like incredibly cheap, way cheap. It's almost free. It's yeah. as close to free as you can get, right? right. And how do, you, how do you then organize your news operation, your journalism operation, to reflect the fact that the fundamental economics of an Internet era news organization are totally different because of that? That the, the space is not the, uh, the scarce thing anymore, as they say, it's the attention. So if right. you can aggregate the attention then you can start to charge a premium, which I think, again, is what the Times and this pay fence arrangement is trying to do. For us, it's not a fence. It's an engagement conversation with our, with our readers because, uh, in the American context anyway, it's hard to find good stuff like we do. There are plenty of bloggers and writers and thinkers and so on, but there are very few, actually, very few journalism organizations um, with a progressive perspective that actually have full-time paid reporters. Right. And that's really the thing that we can offer to people that is hard to, uh, hard to find elsewhere. Uh, and so we can, we have opportunities there to, to do things with people.